I'm going to tell you guys a story that you may know or recall from your schoolhood years, but I just think it's so wonderful. I'm going to tell it to you again. A long time ago, there was an emperor in a faraway land who was known not for his fabulous military council, not for his fabulous wisdom, but rather for his fabulous dress. He had a, a dress for, or a, a new garment for every hour of the day. And it was said of him, the emperor is not in council, but the emperor is in his dressing room. And the kingdom was a fabulous kingdom. People loved it there, everyone. And even these two swindlers that came into town one day, they strolled right on in, knowing the emperor's love for fabulous dress, presented their wears as the most elegant of garments, so elegant, in fact, that only the most refined and the wisest and the most good could even perceive their reality. And so they convinced the entire town that they could weave these garments that only the best of the best could see. And the emperor got word of it. And he said, oh, the best of the best, the most elegant, the most refined, that's me. I must have a set of these clothes. And so he set them to work, gave them gold, gave them silk, gave them everything that they could need to refine these garments. And everything that the swindlers received, they promptly put into their bags and set to work, weaving hard, weaving hard on empty looms. Well, after enough time had passed that they perceived that they uh, should probably be done with these garments, the king wanted to go down, but he was afraid. He, he thought maybe in a moment of self-doubt that he wouldn't perceive the garments. So he sent a minister down to look, and he said, go look, minister, go look at the cloth and see if you like it. And the minister goes down, and he sees, of course, an empty loom. But too embarrassed to say anything, he thought, what if I am unworthy of the cloth that I wear? What if I'm unworthy to perceive these garments? He said, they're the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. As the swindlers described all the elegant patternery in them, he described the gold filigree. The minister agreed, mm-hmm, yes. And he reported back to the king how gorgeous the garments were. And then a little bit later, the king sent another royal official who also affirmed how beautiful these, to him, invisible garments were for fear that he would be a fool for not being able to see them. So the king brought them on board and he dressed himself in these garments that even he had no idea if they even existed. He, they were invisible to him, but he didn't want to seem like he was a fool or less than, so he put them on his body and processed naked through the town. And the whole town, being too embarrassed to admit that they couldn't see these garments that only the best and the smartest could see, applauded the king for his fabulous new clothes. Until eventually a child yelled out, He hasn't got any clothes on! <laughs> And the whole town whispered, did you hear what that child said? They said, the king has no clothes on. And eventually the whole town caught on and they said, you have no clothes on. But the emperor, too proud but shivering, because he anticipated maybe what they said were true, could not admit it and said the parade must go on. What kind of parade will we put ourselves in? And what kind of clothes will we garb ourselves with? That is the question of today. We hear about Jesus coming in to Jerusalem. He's been traveling there over the past several chapters. His face, Scripture calls it, set like flint upon the task that lies before him. And he has a procession, too, that processes around him equally as misunderstanding, ununderstanding, as that which surrounded the foolish, vain emperor. But Jesus is neither foolish nor vain. And he has never hidden what he is doing. But let's read scripture and let's talk about how we need to receive Jesus. Verse 11, or chapter 11, verse 1 begins, When they approached Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and told them, Go into the village ahead of you. As soon as you enter it, you will find a coat, colt tied there, 
on which no one has ever sat, untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here right away. So they went and found a colt outside in the street tied by a door. They untied it, and some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They answered them just as Jesus had said, so they let them go. They brought the donkey to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their clothes on the road, and others spread leafy branches cut from the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. He went into Jerusalem and into the temple. And after looking around at everything, since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This triumphal entry. We love it. It makes me think like we're in Palm Sunday, but we're not quite there yet. This is our regular Palm Sunday reading, and it, it marks off always to us the beginning of what we call the Passion Week. Jesus processes in, people receive him, then they get a whiff of his true message, his true intent, decide that's not what they want, and the Passion Week ends with the crucifixion of Christ, culminating in his resurrection, the foundation of our faith. But we're not there yet. We're at the entrance. We're at the rejoicing. And this is such an interesting reading because in this particular rendition, Mark has it in completely anticlimactic. There's no big thing at the end of it. Jesus comes into Jerusalem, and what does it say in verse 11? He looked around and then camped out of town because it was late. The end. Huh. We'll get into the significance of that here in just a little bit. Let's begin with going in. Jesus, up to this point in his ministry, has been intentionally and markedly reserved. Don't tell. He said it both to demons and to humans. Don't tell anyone what happened to you. Don't tell anyone that you've been healed. Don't tell anyone about who I am or what I have done. And suddenly it flips. He's processing into Jerusalem, and now instead of entering secretly, he says, go get me a mount. Why a mount? Because royalty processes in. They do not walk on foot. They ride in to their city. So Jesus, claiming royalty, mounts a donkey. Now, in that time, you might think, why a donkey? Not like a charger, a steed, something mighty. Now, donkeys weren't as un, uh, unpleasant as we think about them. They were symbolic of humility and peace, were the two adjectives described to this beast of burden. So this conquering king doesn't come in as a conquering king. He comes in as a peaceful king, a humble king, which speaks to his message. And as he processes in on this, colt of a donkey that's never been ridden, folks get all excited because the veils are being taken away and they're seeing for the first time who Jesus might be and they cry out, Hosanna. It's a military term of save us. It's a liberation term. Save us. Occupy Jerusalem. It was enemy territory because of the Romans. They were there. The Israelites didn't want them there. They wanted them out. So here he comes. Mark only records verse 10. Blessed is the coming kingdom our father, of our father David. That's the only gospel that records that line. These folks are anticipating the restored Davidic kingdom, which means they would kick the Romans out. Jesus would sit on the throne. Israel would be restored. That's what these folks were crying out for. Hosanna in the highest heaven, meaning we really mean it. We are really excited that this thing is going to happen. And they're throwing their cloaks on the ground. They're throwing the branches on the ground. He is underst understood to be the royalty that he really is. But they're shouting Hosanna because they want earthly liberation. 
James and John wanted earthly recognition to sit at your right and at your left hand when you come into your kingdom. They weren't thinking heavenly thoughts. They were thinking when we get to Jerusalem and you take the throne, we want to sit here and here. They're no different than the Romans. They're no different than a lot of folks who want the gospel of Christ to be a gospel of earthly power. But if we want earthly power, we've come to the wrong place. Our king rides a donkey into his kingdom. He rides an animal of humility and of peace into his kingdom. And so this really makes me think. It makes me wonder about how we receive Jesus. When he's going the direction we want him to go, we will celebrate him all day long, right? Like, yeah, Jesus, I wanted a million dollars, and I'm on the way. I really celebrate your name. This is great. I'm the rich young ruler. Life is good. But then when he turns it around and he leads me somewhere I don't want to be going, when he says things like, sell all you have and then come follow me, or pick up your cross and follow me, when he starts to lead me places I don't want to go, my perspective begins to change a little bit. And I don't, I'm not as excited to follow after him. Jesus goes into Jerusalem and he begins to inspect. He looks around. If we were to continue our reading, and this is what we're going to talk about next week, is the results of his inspection. If not a pleasing result. In fact, he gets mad about what he sees and he drives them out. So let's pose a couple questions and figure out how to answer these things appropriately together. Number one is do we recognize even the royalty of Jesus? Do we recognize him as king? These guys did, but they put him on the wrong throne. But they had the first step right. Yes, Jesus is king. He does have a kingdom, and we really must rejoice. Jesus said they have to. It's not in this gospel, but in another account, when the Pharisees say, quiet these guys down. He says, I can't. If they didn't, even the rocks would cry out. His rejoicing was his due. This celebration was appropriate for Jesus. Nothing out of place here. So that's the question, number one, that we have to answer. Do we believe Jesus is king royalty? A re recent Varna survey suggests that a third, a third of evangelicals will say Jesus was a good teacher, but not God. That is the foundation of our faith. Jesus is God. That's why we have John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So that we can understand His deity and what He has done for us in our lives. We have to put Him on that. Because if I go down to, well, He's a good teacher, all of this becomes non-binding. If He is just a nice guy, had some good ideas, a philosopher of sorts, we don't have to worry about that, right? But if Jesus is God, then every word that he utters is binding on my soul that I have to follow after him and to do with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's our first decision point. Are you God? Are you my king? Are you my Lord? And when we say yes to that, that's step one. Yes, you are and then suddenly I fall in line behind the procession. I am right there celebrating, preparing the way. And that's what moves us now into this role. We are like modern day John the Baptist. John the Baptist came before as a forerunner to the Christ. He said, my job is to pave the way, make way, make straight the paths. What is our job today? To make disciples of Christ, to keep the bride clean and holy. One of Peter, this is such an interesting phrase, says husbands to their wives, one of our jobs is to wash them in the word. 
One of our jobs is to wash our wives in the word of God, helping them to be pure and clean, not from our own righteousness, but from that of God. And if the marriage is symbolic of that larger relationship of the church and its people, our job then as brothers and sisters in Christ, the bride of Christ, is to find ourselves washed in the word clean and pure and cleansed that it is what makes us clean but only through our obedience to it if he is our lord we need to walk in obedience to that word so that we continue rejoicing even when he makes this sharp turn that deviates from where we want to go and let's not deceive ourselves i don't think there's anybody here who can really say i'm excited about picking up my cross i think that's really going to be thrilling to see myself humbled and crushed under the feet of this world, um, looking forward to it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, folks, the, this, uh, this walk that we walk is so difficult. It's so difficult sometimes, and it's, uh, it's my nature to make light of things that are, are hard, to make it so we can laugh about it a little bit. But the reality of our situation is not in the triumphal entry, except that we are in the procession of Christ. We stand in that line to be identified with him. But ultimately, we are more to be like that Simon of Cyrene, who is conscripted into hoisting up the cross of Jesus when he can't bear it himself anymore. Paul says an interesting thing. He says, I fill up in my flesh that which is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. That was one of the things Paul saw himself as doing. And I've puzzled and puzzled over that. What could that possibly mean? Filling up in his own flesh that which is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. And he just simply means I'm willing to carry the cross, to be seen, to be seen in every way so that folks can look at me and see Jesus, no matter what is happening to me. That's why he writes in Philippians, whether I've got lots of money and people are giving to me, whether I'm shipwrecked and drowning again for the third time, people can look at me and see Jesus no matter what. That's a tall order. Can you imagine yourself on, on your worst day? Life was hard at work. You get home and the kids are grumpy. Someone has a earring holder falls out and if you don't get it fixed then folk we try for an hour and a half to get this little ball bearing put back into her earring my wife comes home within 30 seconds it's fixed like i'm i'm going to bed guys i'll see you later <laughs> i'm grateful for you but it sometimes at the end of the day you're just like i'm spent i got nothing left i have no christ left in me because i i'm tired but that's not the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be when I come to my end, then Christ shows through. And when we get grumpy or irritated or agitated and a human nature shows through all too clearly and we snap and we growl, it reminds us of how difficult the walk really is. You know, C.S. Lewis poses the question, do I have a good and godly character simply because I am well-fed and watered? That's a worthy question. Sometimes for me the answer is yes. But that's what sanctification is, always going farther. So all, all that wraps up in this question, is Jesus my Lord? If he is my Lord, I need to look more like him all the time, to be clothed in him, which takes us to our second point whose garments am I wearing? I tell you that amusing story of the emperor's new clothes, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, because it so ado adequately represents the nature of humanity. I can try and garb myself up in all of my own goodness, in all of my own righteousness, and I might think that I'm looking really, really good. But God looks at me and says, you're naked. We think about that church in the book of revelation where god says you think you're good but i advise you to buy from me clothes that have been 
washed in the blood. I advise you to buy from me white garments, whitened by the blood of the Lamb. If I try and garb myself up in the good stuff, in all of the things that I do, I'm just naked. I'm wretched. I'm poor. No matter what. I may think I'm wise, but I'm foolish. But if I get in line behind Christ and I truly put on his garments, not only is Jesus my Lord, but he will clothe me in all righteousness. He will clothe me with those garments of eternal life. And that's what we want. And that's the second question, is will we let Christ's righteousness shine through us so that all of my own ambitions will be put to death? When I cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, which perspective am I coming from? And that's the third question that we need to ask ourselves. Is am I really seeking God's heavenly, spiritual liberation from the bondage of this world? Save us. Save me, because I can't do it. Or am I asking God to save me in an earthly sense? Save me from poverty. Save me from a life of humility, because I want to be somebody we need to decide well which way we are going when we cry out Hosanna to the Lord. Because his kingdom is coming. His kingdom is here. And its fullness is coming. And we want to cry out to him, Hosanna, Hosanna. Is Jesus your Lord? If he's your Lord, will you let him garb you in the right clothes? And when you cry out to him, How are you doing it? Are you crying out from this sense of deep spiritual need? Or are you crying out for something fleshly and earthly, which would only lead us into more bondage? And then finally, I'd like you to to ask yourself, if Jesus were to come and inspect this temple right now, what would he find? Paul says it so well in 1 Corinthians, in two spots, chapter 2 and 4, He says, don't you know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? We are God's temple. And we will be inspected on our last day. Casting Crowns has a great song where he lines up all the things that we'll be judged on. We'll be judged on everything we thought, every word that we've spoken, every deed that we've done. We'll be laid out in front of us before the throne Revelation says, and then books will be opened. And your life exposed before you and before God as he sits on the great white throne. And we'll stand before him and all of that will be laid out. And then Casting Crowns has the answer too. They're good theologians. It says, but what I've done is trust in Jesus. And that needs to be the answer because no matter what those books say, no matter what is recorded in them, if it is recorded, You trusted in Jesus. You believed in your heart that he was raised from the dead and confessed with your mouth that he is your Lord and then you lived your life as if that were true. Boom. Nailed it. All that stuff will be wiped clean and God says, I'll remember it no more. It's as far as the east is from the west from you. And that's exactly what we want. That's exactly what we need. But if we're trying to garment ourselves in our own righteousness, the inspection is going to go poorly. If we are living a life opposed to our confession of faith, the inspection is going to go poorly. If we say things of Jesus like he is just a good moral teacher, he's going to inspect us poorly. And as we're going to find out, our whole lives will be turned over just as those money changers. So folks, let me say it one more time and then I'll gladly put down the microphone and let God speak for himself. Ask yourself, is Jesus my Lord and do I live like it? Do I let him clothe me in righteousness of him and not my own? Do I cry out for his salvation alone? How will his inspection be if he came today to inspect this temple. 
as we answer those questions is as we seek his mercy and his grace on all those things, may the number one thing that he finds be that we trust him first and most of all. Alvin, would you mind coming up here? We're going to sing a song. and As we do that, and as we cry out to him, we want to, I- if anybody has anything they'd like to pray over, the altar is certainly open to come and, and present yourself before God. If you need to talk with me or someone after church today, come and, come and visit with us. You know, today is Labor Day, but the only labor I want to do is for the Lord and laboring in prayer before him. So let's get ready to sing one last time. My wife and I have a little thing that we like to laugh over almost daily. Uh, We'll just be making our way through our day, and at some point I'll say, yeah, I really am a pretty big deal. (laughs) it is so absurd it's fun to say and it's just kind of a way to to recenter and say i am not a big deal but it's it's fun to say every day (laughs) 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 jesus is the big deal and uh, today we stand in awe of him so would you stand and sing with us You are beautiful beyond description Too marvelous for words Too wonderful for comprehension Like nothing ever seen or heard Who can grasp your infinite wisdom Who can fathom the depths of your love? You are beautiful beyond description, majesty enthroned above. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in awe of you. You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words. Too wonderful for comprehension Like nothing ever seen or heard Who can grasp your infinite wisdom Who can fathom the depths of your love You are beautiful beyond description majesty enthroned above and i stand i stand in awe of you i stand i stand in awe of you holy god to whom all praise is due i stand in awe of you Holy God, to whom all praise is due. Lord, we stand in awe of you. Father, we do stand in awe of you because you are 
remarkable. You are amazing. We are owing you everything in our life. All that is good. All that is perfect. Lord, you walk us through all those things that are not because we live in the now. We live in the valley of the shadow of death. And yet our eyes are on the city of glory that you're calling us towards. Our eyes are on the cross that you call us to. Let us cling to you, God, because only in you can we throw off the shackles of this world. You clothe us in righteousness. You hide our shame and our nakedness, and you transform it into something glorious, children of the living God, called out to be your ambassadors in this world, here and now. Oh, God, lead us. We are holding up the train of your robe. We are excited to be your servants, God. We're unworthy of untying your sandals and that you, you, let, you let us proclaim your name and your word. So Lord, let us go from here emboldened by your truth and your power, not our own, clothed in righteousness, lifting high the cross. Thank you, God, for your great mercy and your many blessings. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen.